You're listening to Secrets for Scaling, a Gecko Board podcast that explores the growth secrets of successful founders and CEOs. For this episode, we spoke with Mark Chung, co-founder and CEO of Vertigris, an IoT company helping commercial buildings be more efficient. Hi, Mark. Welcome to Secrets for Scaling. Hi, Shannon. It's a pleasure to be here. To kick things off, can you tell us a bit about what Vertigris is, who your customers are, and what your business model is? Vertigris is basically an IoT company. We've developed um, a sensor network that we use to help commercial buildings manage all of their electrical equipment. Our future mission is to sustain and enrich human life through responsive energy intelligence. And so that means we want to be a part of taking all of the information from buildings and using that to drive a more intelligent way that, that humans consume energy. Today, all of our customers fall into either two segments. That's either large um, industrial manufacturing facilities like Jables Factories, um, as well as small and medium enterprise businesses like hotels and hospitals that have individual uh, buildings with um, individual energy management needs. And our business model today is also to offer a software as a service. So how big is the company now in terms of both team size and traction? Today, we are 24 people in terms of team size. Uh, In terms of traction, we're still growing our customer base. We have about 50 customers today um, that range from individual hotels to very large uh, multinational corporations. And how is the team structured? We've gone through a lot of different stages of evolution, but today we're structured as six functional teams that range from software engineering, hardware engineering, customer operations, sales, and business operations. Each team has elected representatives, and those elected representatives work together to make decisions for the company. Can you dive into the stages of evolutions a bit? How did you get to where you are today in terms of team structure? Um, So John and I, when we founded the company, we came from a very structured, functionally structured uh, company that was doing microprocessor design. So in that group, we or, we were organized very much like an engineering a team where each person that we brought on had a specific functional domain of expertise. Over time, we found that to be a very poor way to facilitate collaboration around the team and to increase our velocity. And so we started to experiment with just making making certain that people were more cross-functional, broadening the skill sets within the team and making more people that had overlapping skill sets collaborate on the same team. And that eventually led to us needing designated, I mean, getting large enough to the point where we needed designated roles for organizing how that workflow would exist. And we didn't want to reintroduce management hierarchy the way it had existed at a previous company for us. And so we created this elected team structure role where a team representative is basically in a role for two quarters and then that representative gets rotated out. What role does that elective representative play? What exactly do they do? Well, today it's a little bit of a hybrid role. There's one is um, we, so our teams, regardless of whether they're an engineering team or a business team, we all operate with the same agile paradigm, which is uh, largely taken from uh, the Scrum methodology. What, we, what that representative does is kind of serves a hybrid product owner and scrum master role, uh, where the primary responsibility is to maintain a, a pivotal board with a list of cards and tasks and the rank the priorities of these cards and tasks relative to other teams' needs as well. So that team representative will meet with other team representatives, will decide the most important um, interdependent stack ranking of the, these cards on a sprint by sprint basis, and then to communicate those needs back to their teams and then facilitate the sprint as it it moves through the two weeks. And does that apply to non-product teams like marketing and sales as well? Yeah, even our sales team. I think the biggest friction we have today is actually our sales team who it's pretty hard to manage a sales team using a scrum methodology because sometimes things tend to be a little bit more reactive than proactive but we're still we're still using that paradigm there how have you made that work how have you overcome some of those challenges with the sales team well i would say today it doesn't quite work uh but um, we're still working on it i mean we have some ideas so i think one of the biggest challenges that we had was the length of the sprint for sales teams so 
by making, we went from two weeks where we, every other team operates on a two week sprint. Sales teams operate on a one week sprint for two reasons. One is it's really hard for a salesperson to predict what accounts they will actually talk to and touch across a two week basis. It's much easier to do that on a weekly basis because you'll have your your set of targets that you'll want to talk to. And then you'll have, you know, some small allocation of inbound and sort of additional, you know, kind of emergent accounts like inbound requests and leads that come in through, you know, various places. And we sort of carve off a small s- section of chores that is related to navigating and managing the inbound. And then we will um, have the rest of our sprint be devoted to pushing these specific accounts. And we do it a lot of team-based selling. Part of the transition or the trick that we're trying to do now is make sure that the sales teams are motivated as a team and making sure that their compensation, uh, whatever variable compensation that they do have, is tied to the success of that sprint and that team versus just um, their individual accounts, uh, so to speak. That's great. I'd imagine that fosters a lot of collaboration among them. Yeah, it does. And it's sort of a, it's a growing pain that they're trying to experience and go through. How do you and your team identify, define, and communicate your goals and metrics to keep everyone motivated? Every quarter we meet as a company in its entirety. And I think we can still do that today because we're relatively small still. Um, And I'm not sure how that might evolve over time, but we'll meet once a quarter for a couple days. um, And we will define as a group, we'll go through these planning exercises and workshops that will help us identify a set of objectives and key results. So we use the OKR paradigm. To come up with these objectives and key results, we go through a SWOT analysis. We go through all the classic, um, you know, kind of planning workshop exercises, kind of get people thinking about what we want to be in the next quarter and what we want to be in the next year. The founders and I will meet ahead of that, and we will sort of debate and negotiate what the yearly plan looks like, but it's a very broad, loosely defined uh, set of yearly objectives. And then the team representatives working with their teams will take that plus the planning exercise, and we will have OKRs for every team and for every individual. And we use those to basically drive how we manage the sprints and what we want to get accomplished in each of the sprints, and also manage how we measure the success of those objectives. How do you balance your leadership goals and visions as founders versus what the team brings to the table? <laughs> it's a it's a negotiation, um, as always. Uh, I mean, I think we are in a space where we believe so much of what we need to do is be innovators and to bring innovation to a, a new kind of space, which means we can't run our organization like a strict organizational hierarchy. We need to we need to be able to enable the team with a level of autonomy and decision making, which means we cannot overstep our positional authority and say, hey, this is what the founders need to do, because we just don't know. We don't know what the right decisions are to make, um, what the right innovations will be. All of those things have to come from the team. And so I would say it's a kind of a, it's a negotiation because what the founders can do is create a set of goals, a set of objectives, clearly and crisply articulate what, why those are important and what those mean to us, and then let the team fill in the tactical strategy, the, the how we're going to achieve those objectives. And where we have some disagreements about what we want to do, most often those come in the form of the right resources in place or the right skill sets in place. And when that's the case, uh, then it becomes our responsibility as founders to go out and get the resources that they need or, or get the skill sets that they need to achieve those goals. So it sounds like you give them a lot of ownership. Absolutely. Was that difficult to give up or was it, did it just come naturally from the very beginning considering what your product is? You know, I think philosophically, I think power is a very, you know, I mean, I would describe it as just pure power, but I mean, the positional authority of a founder can sometimes be a handicap for a company. And particularly with our line of business, where we, we are going into a market that hasn't been really fully formed, and we're not trying to be the cheapest, fastest version of X we're trying to create a new version of an XYZ or a new, completely different way of doing ABC. In those cases, I think it really is important to give up that 
positional authority and to enable a team to be very collaborative in order to be successful. I mean, if you look at the most successful companies today that didn't exist 10 years ago, I think they approached it in very much the same way. So it wasn't difficult for the sake of the mission. It just really depends on what the motivation of the founders are. But in our case, it was really the sake of the mission. And in, for, in order for us to be successful, it was a necessity. So you set OKRs up with your team every quarter. How do you keep them focused on those objectives and key results in between those meetings? Every team operates on these, these two-week sprints, except for, as I mentioned, the, the non-engineering teams will operate on a weekly sprint. But in both cases, there will be a cadence every two weeks where there will be an all-hands meeting. And in that all-hands meeting, each of the team representatives will come back to the group and present what their OKR was, where they are in terms of that measurement, and what the team has achieved from that sprint, and where they have blocks or asks or what they didn't achieve. And so we do this every, every two weeks, and it kind of serves to remind everyone that these were the objectives we set out for the quarter. These were the key results we wanted to be measured to. And we continued to then be aligned to either, either that same objective. But if there's something suddenly very different, everyone is made aware of that. Switching gears a bit, how do you manage your time as a founder? It's difficult because a founder is it's kind of a 24-7 job. But I'm also, you know, a parent, a husband, you know, I... I think still myself and um, I have friends. Um, so I think I had to give up a little bit on the friends side of things, but still I try to maintain a pretty rigorous calendar around my family time. So I will block off, you know, two hours an evening to spend time with my wife and my kids. And then in the morning, I just have a very, very strict routine. I wake up at, you know, 5.30, uh, try to get in some form of exercise, either running a few miles or going to the gym, then I will go straight into the top items of the day that I need to uh, address. And then I will spend maybe an hour uh, just trying to get back to inbox zero as quickly as possible and then jump into the sprint of my team. So I'm also an individual contributor on one of our teams, which is the business operations team. And I try to manage the number of tasks that I have there. And then in the late mid morning, I take any external meetings that I need and then in the afternoon, I carve off for uh, individual teamwork. That's pretty much it. It just repeats. <laughs> How did you find that the process that works for you? Um, I read a book. It was a book about single mothers. Um, <laughs> it called the, I think it was called 168 Hours or something like that. I can't exactly recall. But it's a book for single mothers. And it talks about how, very, very tactical steps for making sure that you can, you know, be a single mother, have a job, be a good mom, take care of your kids, all those things. And I thought, you know, that book has to have some secrets for how to manage your time eff effectively, because if there's anyone that has um, challenges doing this well, uh, would be single, I would imagine to be someone with as many responsibilities as a single mother. So I, I read that book and I applied the techniques that I learned from it. So one thing founders struggle with is building a culture of innovation versus a purely operational culture or striking the balance between the two. You guys definitely lean towards a culture of innovation, but when do you think it makes sense to build one over the other? I think that a culture of innovation, I think for technology companies, that must always exist. And I read, a, I, you know, I recently ran into a very interesting visual map of Google versus Apple and where the innovation centers of innovation occur. And you can see what's really fascinating about that visual is that at Google, they truly do have a culture of innovation because you have patents being generated all throughout the organization. Whereas at Apple, I would say it's less so. Um, it could still be a culture of innovation, but a very hierarchical one. And it, you can see these very strong clusters of, of patents um, happening only within a specific subgroup of people. So <clears throat> the question of when to build an operational culture versus when to build an innovation culture, you, you actually need both. When you're a tech company, you always need the culture of innovation. And when you're early enough stage, that's almost all you need. You need to be figuring out the product market fit. That has to be the most important thing that the company tries to do in the beginning. And so you need to be constantly innovating. When you transition from having that product market fit to a company that's either in the growth or expansion stage, 
that's when you need to start building some operational culture into the company. But you don't want to kill the culture of innovation when you do that, which is a very tricky thing. You'll have figured out by that time what the product needs to be to make it fit for a period of time, and you want to grow that. You want to grow it fast and efficiently, and so you need to figure out how to repeat the steps that you're doing well and effectively. And in those environments, you do have to uh, kind of build a playbook and then operate on that playbook. So that's that's a that's an important transition. But I think you don't want to go too far to the other end. I mean, I think when you get to a purely operational company, those are when you have industries that are very, very mature, very well known, and you don't need to continue to innovate. And I would argue that almost nothing exists purely in this way. But if you were to start a company that you only wanted to live and exist for a period of time, a finite period of time, then you might say, okay, I want to be a specific type of restaurant. Or I want to be a specific type of accounting firm, uh, you know. And in those cases, you can set up a purely operational culture. Not much innovation has to happen, and then you can operate for a small period of time very efficiently. So I guess at the end, it really just comes back to the goal of the founder and the goal of the company. Because if you want to be a company that's changing or disrupting a landscape and creating a new paradigm, and you want to be a technology company, then it's really important to start out with a culture of innovation and keep that culture of innovation alive as you grow. What do you think that team number is where you go from that when you have to start scaling that culture with a company? I think you get to about 30 in general. It's been my experience. I would say that you get to about 30 and somewhere around that 30 person, you get enough people that it's hard to keep track of, of everything that everyone else is doing and know everyone in the company. And it just becomes a little bit of a mental, a mental exercise just to do that, that one piece. And I think right around then you start to think about scaling up specific groups. Um, And I would say the groups that tend to be less innovation and more operations are your your either your customer teams um, or your sales and marketing teams in, in some cases or, or I guess I'll take marketing out of there it's purely your sales teams and your operational teams that tend to be more operational and that's where you start to find some seeds of hierarchy starting to layer in. And it's, I guess I would say, yeah, right around team, uh, team size of 30. And in between 30 and 100, you start to innovate. Or you, you, can, you can introduce organizational structures that help to mitigate some of the potentially toxic components of what those hierarchies can do. Yeah, I think there's, I think there's actually some new, new ways to handle this that we're working on that um, hopefully will allow us to not hit any of these growing pains well into you know, team sizes of 200 or more. By new ways, do you mean your unique approach to hierarchy and having the designated team members? Yeah, some of that is, some of those elements are involved in there. I think um, we're trying a little bit more of like a rotation program, a cross-functional, a cross-functional kind of group uh, with different sub-functions where people can be in one big cross-function but have to move through different uh, different functional teams. We're just trying a couple of different things. You mentioned that playbook, which I imagine should be developed as close to day one as possible. Are there any resources for companies to go to that you know of to help them build those playbooks for their company? Because I imagine that can look very different for different teams. Wow. Uh, Yeah, (laughs) that's a great question. So there's tons of books written out there. Almost every, it's kind of a new thing in Silicon Valley, which is uh, if you have some measure of success, you probably need to publish a book. So there's tons of books out there uh, that talk about founders and founder stories and how they did what they did. I would encourage people just to read as many of those as they can. Uh, Ultimately, glean and abstract the information out of it that applies to your business and to you. The internet is a wealth of resources. Don't get stuck into um, just your local sphere and what you can come up with on your own because I'm sure many, many people out there have tried to do different things and they would happily share their experiences. And I think you can find that all over the web. Maybe podcasts like uh, what you guys are doing. (laughs) Right, exactly. Like what you're doing right now. What unique IoT opportunities for online businesses do you see emerging in the next couple of years? 
if you can think of a physical component of your life that has an inter interaction that's that's physical, like uh, you know whether it's sleeping, whether it's watching TV, getting in your car, sitting in your room, every single one of those today can be transformed into an IoT business. Every object, your carpet, your socks, your floor, I mean, your dresser, all of these can be basically connected online and made more intelligent just by adding a human intelligence to it. And that's, that's going to happen. That's going to happen everywhere. I, I would say uh, there's, when you, I guess the question here, unique. <laughs> I don't know if there's any of these are going to be, are going to be unique. I mean, they're definitely not here today, but sensors and actuators and chips have become so cheap. Uh, communication bandwidth has become incredibly cheap. And I, you know, I've recently talked to a bunch of guys from Verizon who are talking about their next roadmap of what they can do with low bandwidth 4G LTE. And it's, it's only a matter of time before you see a blanket network that's super, super cheap to tap into that you can have very s smart version of anything for a marginal improvement, a marginal cost increase. So it's going to be everywhere. Plates, mirrors. I know I'm just kind of looking around my hotel room. <laughs> that's everything. Yeah. So now that Vertigris is over five years old, if you're going to give any piece of advice to founders who are just beginning to scale their business, what would it be? It's as tempting as it is to become, you know, you start to get money from customers and you start to get traction. Um, as tempting as it is to become a customer-led company. And I, th I say that this is, uh, this is the advice that almost everyone will universally give is like a customer-driven company, customer-centric or customer-first, customer-led innovation. You hear this all over the place. As soon as you start to make money from these customers, you're going to have a strong desire to continue to do that, to continue to listen to your customer, and to continue to try and drive innovation based off of what your customer is telling you. But I would say the most important thing at this stage is, is also to not let yourself lose sight of the spirit of innovation. And that's not to say don't listen to your customers, but to continue to innovate around your customer's pain point by truly hearing what their pain points are. Don't just do everything that they're telling you to do. Continue to use your founder intuition and your understanding of their pain point to drive an innovation into what they're doing. That's super critical not to lose. Thank you for listening to Gecko Board's Secrets for Scaling podcast. If you know someone who you think would be a great guest for Secrets for Scaling, or if you want to share your own scaling story, email me anytime at shannon at geckoboard.com. We'd love to have you. If you've been enjoying Secrets for Scaling, please consider giving us a review on iTunes. We'd appreciate it.